Good morning. In his letter to the church at Thessalonica, Paul is dealing with panic. And again, these Christians in this city, in the northern part of Greece back a couple thousand years ago, word has come to them supposedly from Paul that the day of the Lord has already come. Now, the day of the Lord is when Christians get what they were waiting for. Jesus comes back and brings them to heaven, and, and the fact that they believe they've heard the day of the Lord has already come is causing alarm and panic. They are talking about nothing else than end time scenarios and how it works and, and if they missed it. And what Paul ends up doing, he assures them in this letter that they have not been left behind. He says that there's a couple things that need to happen that haven't happened yet. There's supposed to be something called the rebellion and that the man of lawlessness must be revealed. This hasn't happened yet. And so because it hasn't happened, the day of the Lord couldn't have come yet. And, and we looked at that prophecy and it would seem that one One fulfillment of that prophecy, probably the one that Paul had in mind, was the Jewish rebellion in 70 A.D., where they rebelled against Roman rule. The Romans came in and sacked the city. Part of that was the John of Geskala. He was this uh, Jewish insurgent that commanded Jewish forces, and he was part of the... He was part of the the power structure within the city that tried to convince people that, no, the Romans will never come into this city. God will protect this city. And that wasn't God's will. And that's when he... It could have been the man of lawlessness being revealed and the rebellion. But having dealt with those things and calmed people down, he moves on to major issues. He encourages them to give roots and wings to the gospel. We talked about last week giving roots to the gospel talked about a couple of things that he would have us do is relative to the gospel, give it deep roots. A couple of things in terms of giving the gospel deep roots, the Spirit's influence and the good news. And when we talk about what it is that God uses to create depth in our life, everything seems to focus on the Word of God and understanding what is the message that God is trying to communicate to us. But that's not where it stops. It's not supposed to be knowledge for knowledge's sake. It's not just digging deep roots. It's growing wide branches. And what wide branches is about, it's about influence. It's about not just existing for us, but existing for others. And when the Bible talks about this, it talks about good deeds and good words. And so that is what Paul prays when... He prays the gospel has roots, that it would enable people to dig deep roots into the Word and grow wide branches, but he doesn't stop there. We look biblically at what we need to do in order for these things to occur. A couple things, we remain in the Word. And if we remain in it, focusing on what it is, what is the message that God would have us consider. God removes, the word for removes is the word prunes. And if you think of a tree that you'd want to bear fruit, what you have to do is provide that tree with the type of environment that it could grow in. And then expertly take away branches and leaves and things that get in the way of production. And when that happens, then fruit is produced. Relative to responsibility, because we want to be clear about this, we remain, that's our job, is to take God's Word seriously, try to focus on what He would have us focus on. And again, as you heard Denise talk about, relative to one thing that we have appreciated about Bessie is her focus on God's commitments. And she did a lot of work, and her reason is so that our children could begin to remain in that message. Understanding the commitments God makes to them. Why would we do that? Because as they remain, God will remove those things, those thoughts and attitudes about God that get in the way of fruit production. That is what gets in the way. Are the things that we've taught about God that are not in line with what He is. As we stay in the Word, we end up hearing something. It challenges something we've learned. And we call it into question. I think that's what pruning looks like. And what ends up happening then, as it's a process, then God enables us to 
speak good words and do good deeds. Paul goes on in his letter. You've got a worship folder. There's a sheet in the middle. We won't. We're going to briefly look at a couple things. He touches on the whole issue of prayer. And he says, finally, this is what I want you to pray about. I like the skit. It drew attention to the fact that what are we supposed to pray about? I mean, what's God's will? And Paul identifies for us a couple things that God cares about. Let's look at the first one, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 1. Finally, brothers, pray for us that the message of the Lord may spread rapidly and be honored just as it was with you. Praise that the message would spread. This is a cottonwood uh, forest, a bunch of cottonwood trees. Ever been to Yankton? Sometimes we'd go, Marsha and I would go up to Yankton, up to, there's a cottonwood day area, right uh, up by Lewis and Clark State Park. The cottonwood trees, and in certain parts of the year in the springtime, the cottonwood, it, the, the Seeds are borne aloft on this stuff that's like cotton. And, and actually, I saw some pictures. It actually looks like snow on the ground. Cottonwood seeds are borne on the wind to bring these seeds to other places where there aren't cottonwoods. That's where reproduction occurs. And, um, and so this is an image of, there's, you can see, perhaps, this is the trees, they have white on them. We have things in us that God is doing. God produces things in us. And what Paul would have them to pray about, these things that come from remaining in the message, his prayer is that the message would be spread, that the news would be borne aloft and go elsewhere where people don't understand God's commitments, where they don't know the good news. He prays that the message would be spread. It's important to be clear about the message that God wants to be borne aloft. What is it? Look at what it says in 2 Thessalonians chapter 5. Second verse there. It says, All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation, that God was reconciling the world to himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. And he has committed to us the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors. As though God were making his appeal through us, we implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. What is the message? Some of you want to circle. You want to circle something? Circle three words. Okay? Got a pencil if you want to. Again, I want you to highlight three words. The message of reconciliation. If you were to give a word or a title to the good news that God wants us to proclaim, the middle of that verse says... He has committed to us, look at the, right in the middle of that passage, He has committed to us the message of reconciliation. And if you want to find a word that describes what is it that God is trying to say, if we were to boil it down to one word, you know, there's a bunch of things the Bible says. If we were to boil it down to a word, what would that be? And when Paul picks a word, this is the word he picks, reconciliation. Reconciliation is the rekindling of a relationship. It's what happens when what kept people apart is taken out of the way. They have buried the hatchet. And reconciliation is when there is an open door on both sides to relationship. And two people that had been at odds with one another, this is not reconciliation, this is conflict. What reconciliation is, is when this occurs. And the seats are turned toward each other. And what the message is that God is in this seat. And the message that He brings to the world, see, the world thinks that God is like this. The message is God is like this, and Paul is praying that people would understand that. God wants to sit down with you. Why? Because He wants to have a relationship with you. That's what the message is. Now, some of us, when we put our... In terms of what we were taught, the message of the Bible is, it wasn't that. It was, it was this. God is frustrated and beside himself with the state of the world. Does God like sin? No. But he understands. You know what the solution to the world's... I'm going to show you something. You know what the solution to the world's sin problem is? That is... 
That is. Do you know what people want? They want to be loved by somebody whose love never goes away. That's what, that's what you want. That's what I want. And that's the message. And if people got in touch with what God actually wanted, it would change them. That's why Paul prays that the message would be spread. So the people would understand what God's intentions are. The desires of reconciliation. This is, you know what this is like? The reason why I like this picture, if when you go to the day area, you know, when you go camping, some of you have been camping or will go camping. What does it feel like when you get out in the woods, you put up your tent, you take the comfortable chair out. Maybe you've built a fire. There's a cold drink. You turn off the cell phone. Not a lot of things in... You sit down. And if you and your wife have been running around, haven't had a lot of time to connect, it's a time to connect. This is the image of the message God would have. It's really what He desires. See, there are things that He wants us to do but he doesn't want us to be so busy that we fail to connect with him. That's really what he wants. Reconciliation, that's the message. You know what the deal is with this? It's, there's no danger here. There's no need to be wary. There's no hostile intentions. It's safe. And this is the deal. Look what it says. It indicates that God was in Christ. Jesus acted on the Father's behalf. Sometimes we split up Jesus desires with the Father. You know, the Father is going, you know, and Jesus is friendly. No, Jesus acted on the Father's behalf. Jesus was reflecting the very message that the Father wanted to give. It wasn't one felt this way, the other felt they are in harmony. Jesus reflected, acted on the Father's behalf, and the Father acted through the Son. And look what it says. God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, doing this. The Father demonstrating mercy over judgment. And what the passage says, God was reconciling the world to Himself in Christ, not counting men's sins against them. So what drove God to come, He didn't have men's sins on His mind when He sent Christ. Now He's saying, wait a minute. But we have to understand, what is it at the pulse of God's desire? Does He want to come and deal and beat up sin? No, this is what He's looking for. He's looking for relationship to be reconciled because he knows this is the solution to the sin problem. To understand him and his commitments. And I think this it might be hard to see. I am not at war with you. That's the message. And that's the message God has for you. God is not at war with you. You say, well, he's not. Because the message is the message of what? Reconciliation. When you're reconciling with somebody, are you at war with them? No, the war's over. If, if the message is reconciliation, then wartime is not the message that he wants to bring. God is not at war with you. And you know what he says? I want you to tell others. There's a bunch of people that think that God is at war with them. Because they do stupid things. And what God wants to say, I'm not at war with you. He wants people to spend time remaining in His Word so that His intentions can transform us from the inside and make us the people He wants us to be. He has given us the same message that He gave Jesus. When we speak on God's behalf, we are to represent God as open and inclusive. We are to represent a God who came in peace. I'll tell you what, now I understand that that sin grieves God, but this is to represent God as being sick to death with an immoral world is to misrepresent Him. You say, what, the message is one of reconciliation. To represent God as being up to here with an immoral world is to misrepresent Him. When you place your finger on God's pulse, you do not find hatred of sin. You find the desire to cultivate an awareness of His peaceful intentions. And again, to represent God as barely containing His wrath is to represent Him. To represent God as angry and hostile is to misrepresent Him. 
Don't pray for this message to be spread. The message of an angry, hostile God who is had Don't pray for that message to be spread. It's already everywhere. You don't need to pray for that one to be spread. That's rampant. You can go to any one of a number of places and it's said loudly and clearly. This is the message that we need to pray to be spread. The message of reconciliation. The fruit that the message of anger bears is not the fruit of the Spirit. Pray for the message to be spread and pray for the messengers to be spared. Uh, look what it says, 2 Thessalonians chapter 3, verse 2. And pray that we may be delivered from wicked and evil men, for not everyone has faith. Uh, Paul proclaimed the message to city after city, Thessalonica, Corinth, Philippi, uh, place after place, Ephesus. And we find a pattern. If you look at the Acts of the Apostles and try to follow Paul, he did three missionary journeys. And what the Spirit told him in the beginning, you're going to go from city to city and it's not going to be pretty because people are not going to accept what you say. But still he went from city to city. And this is what we find. He goes in and because of his words and the miracles that prove that he is an authorized representative of the gospel. And at that time, those miracles were helpful and needed. Uh, what you find that he convinces people of the truth. And then what you find is sacred leaders from primarily Jerusalem come and are able to turn the secular authorities against Paul. He's beaten and run out of town on a rail. And it happens city after city, comes in, appeals to people. A bunch of people say, That's, that sounds like the truth. And, but then others, political figures, are able to stir the people up, and he ends up getting beat up and run out of town on a rail. But you know what ends up getting left behind? Seeds. Because the message was spread like the cottonwood seeds on the wind. Seeds planted in different places, and people can never really forget what he said. And those seeds spring up, and, and the people, well, I'm talking about people like you, that remain in the Word. The roots go down into it, and the branches start to spread. And good deeds and good words end up producing seeds, and individual. well, you do that, when you talk to somebody about what God is like, and you don't have to always share the whole message, it could be little things, good deeds, good words, being helpful, saying, yeah, I'll pray about that, and, and reflecting a God, you know, God really cares about that. God matters to you. Those kind of, you matter to God. Um, those type of things were the things that were going on. You know what it seems like when you look at reproduction from a tree perspective, I don't think the tree experiences a lot of pain. It doesn't, it's not the tree that experiences the pain. I've got a bunch of maple trees. I experience the pain. They have those little whirly bird things. And, you know, I try to put those things in the gutters. They haven't created, now I know it's the gutter helmets, maybe those work. But my thing, you know what I tried? I tried one of those little sieve things that you put over the top of your gutters. And they're like, you know what they're like? They're like, those little whirly bird beds. I mean, I don't know how they do it. It's like an army of them. They just stick in, and so they're all standing at attention. And then I, I looked up in the, in the back of my garage, and Marcia said, Mike, I hate to say it, there's something growing in the gutter. And I had left those whirly bird things in, and, you know, there was enough dirt there that it would, there were plants this high. And, and uh, yeah, so, so, but, so, relative to this type of leaf, you know, the tree doesn't experience pain, but reproduction. Uh, women, you would have a different story. Reproduction is painful. Reproduction is painful. And when God designs what happens relative to people reproducing faith, you know what it does seem? That people who are effective in reproducing the message experience pain. A couple of verses. Let me read. Jesus. There were some Greeks among the feasts. There were some Greeks among those who went up to worship at the feast. They said to Philip, who was from Bethsaida in Galilee, Sir, we want to see Jesus. Philip went to tell Andrew. Andrew and Philip in turn told Jesus. And this is what Jesus said. The hour has come for the Son of Man to be glorified. Listen to this. I tell you 
the truth, unless a kernel of wheat falls to the ground and dies, it remains only a single seed. But if it dies, it produces many seeds. The man who loves his life will lose it, while the man who hates his life in this world will keep it for eternal life. It seems like he's saying that living a life devoid of pain, that's not that's not the kind of thing Jesus is talking about. He said, a person who lives for themselves isn't the kind of person that bears fruit. Bearing fruit is a part of sacrificing and pouring your life out. Reproduction, I guess, is painful. And so what I'm saying by that, that's not at all wonderful. I'm into that. But if you're experiencing pain, that could be part of the process. See, it's not just about, well, why am I suffering? I must have done something wrong. No. No. It might be that you're getting prepared to bear fruit. It's not about you doing stuff wrong. It's about the kind of people that God uses in the lives of other people are people who understands what it, understand what it's like to be in pain and to hold on to God in the midst of it because of an awareness of his commitment. Paul's greatest threats, when you look at it, didn't come from secular authorities, but sacred. We're going to read this verse and... Uh, be done. Look what it says. Paul writes, I'm jealous for you with a godly jealousy. I promised you to one husband to Christ so that I might present you as a pure virgin to him. I'm afraid that just as Eve was deceived by the serpent's cunning, your minds may somehow be led astray from your sincere and pure devotion to Christ. For if someone comes and preaches a Jesus other than the Jesus we preached, or if you receive a different spirit from the one you received, or a different gospel from the one you accepted, you put up with it easily enough. But I don't think I am in the least inferior to these super apostles, for such men are false apostles, deceitful workmen, masquerading as apostles of Christ, and no wonder. For Satan himself masquerades as an angel of light. It is not surprising then if his servants masquerade as servants of righteousness. You know people Paul had the biggest problem with? People who talked about Jesus, and they cared about righteousness. But strangely enough, it says they work for Satan. See, you can talk about Jesus and describe him as the Jesus who is like that. A Jesus who turns his back is frustrated, and that's not the real Jesus. This is another Jesus. It's a Jesus who died... But it's not, it's not the true Jesus. And what, what Paul understood, the greatest problems he experienced were those whose Jesus looked like that. They have a different spirit. And there was a different gospel. It wasn't good news. It was something less than that. I'm going to ask the worship team to come forward. I'm going to read just a, an article from 40 Days with the Ten Commitments about dealing gently, gentle. If asked to describe God's dealings with mankind, perhaps not the first word we would choose. A casual reading of the Bible, especially the Old Testament, reveals scenes we would not call gentle dealings. Forceful. Better word? A more realistic appraisal of God's dealing with mankind? Jesus thought so. From the days of John the Baptist until now, the Bible says, the kingdom of heaven has been forcefully advancing, and forceful men lay hold of it. Prior to his own coming to earth, Jesus described God's kingdom as forcefully advancing. According to Jesus, God historically revealed himself through forceful men. He used John the Baptist as a case in point. John the Baptist's diet, locusts and wild honey, definitely not quiche. His clothing, a scratchy tunic made of camel's hair. His manner, forceful. He rebuked a king and ended up being beheaded for it. John the Baptist represented God's kingdom forcefully. Jesus Christ re represented God's kingdom gently. Jesus said, no one knows the Son except the Father, and no one knows the Father except the Son, and those to whom the Son chooses to reveal Him. Jesus made a clear distinction between Himself and all who preceded Him as God's spokespersons. John the Baptist included. Jesus claimed to be God the Son. He, ex he claimed the exclusive rights to represent God the Father. As the Son of God, Jesus claimed to be the Word through whom good God fully and finally reveals Himself to the world. Jesus did not describe Himself as forceful. Jesus' greatest critics, and I'll close with this, 
were those who stubbornly held on to the notion that God still dealt with people forcefully. They could not accept that Jesus was God, no matter how many miracles he performed. Why? Because Jesus was gentle, and their God was forceful. Jesus said, Come to me, all you who are weary and burdened, and I will give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and humble in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. He invites you to come to him. Relax. He invites you to come to him. Relax. Breathe. God deals gently with you. We pray. Oh, Father, thank you for your message. We really do want to sound the note that you'd have a sound screeching, discordant cipher notes like what just happened. We don't want to be that. We don't want to be screechy. We don't want to make people tense up. We don't want to make people feel like that's what you want from them. Would you help us to reflect you accurately? Your voice to us is not screechy does not frighten us. Your message is one of reconciliation. You understand what we are. You understand what we do. You do not approve of all the things we do and all the thoughts that we have. That's why you want us to sit down with you. You want to express your commitments to us. The fear and shame that drives our craziness only comes as we live in the light of your face. That's it. We don't do that perfectly, but would you help us to remain in your word and you can remove from us all the images of you that end up making us crazy, and would you reproduce yourself through us so that we might more reflect your desire to people. And we come from a lot of different backgrounds, and it takes a long time to learn, but we want to see you for what you like, and we want to reflect what you're like to others for the sake of your kingdom in the name of your Son, in whose name we pray. Amen.